intended as entertainment. The degree to which it tells the truth in metaphorical fashion. I suspect the writer knew it and the producer didn't. The name of the class is Modern Myths, and we've discussed uh, some of the forms of the myths last week, and we sh I showed a video which those of you who have uh, cable television or have access to the IMDB network, you can download, you can watch The Playhouse Presents the Man which is intended to be an entertaining play, but is also a, uh, an allegory for how the world actually works nowadays. It was IMTV, right? Uh, that, that's uh, a, it's, it's a, a, it's a network like Netflix okay. that's gotcha. available gotcha. on, and I had to memorize it because I just wanted to say IMBD, and that's not the way it is. Okay. But, if, if you Google Playhouse Presents the Man, that's one of the sites you will be introduced to. I don't know what the fee is. I was able to download it when it wasn't, when one, is, when one was not being charged for it. Uh, and it's a marvelous allegory. And uh, Mrs. Clinton gave us an absolutely astonishing demonstration of one of the modern myths in her article, I think it is, well, she wrote it for Time Magazine, in which she said, the United States is a, uh, an exceptional and indispensable nation because of our military might and of our good nature and the way we want to spread democracy and a lot of other nonsense. And I apologize. I warned the... Uh, the uh, attendees last week that if you have an emotional connection to either Israel or the United States, you might be offended by some of the things that I will say. Because I love what the United States says it stands for, and if I deduce from what it does, I abhor what it does. So. Take that or leave it as you will. Likewise for Zionism, which we'll get into somewhere along in the course in the, of, the, um, of the semester. Mrs. Clinton was promoting the modern version of the myth of uh, the city set on the hill or manifest destiny. The unfortunate reality about American history is that, by and large, English-speaking people came over and massacred non-English-speaking people. They killed their food supply. They drove them out of their locations for living onto what are clearly, um, what is the word I'm looking for? stations or camps for prisoners of war. That's why they're called reservations. I am interested in clarifying for myself as well as for you who is doing some of these evil things, how are they doing them, and why are they doing them? Which is why I have this little chart set up here. Um, if we're, conspiracies are when Janet and I get together and plan a surprise party for Dawn. Now that happens to be a nice conspiracy, but for better or for worse, conspiracies are all over the place. And conspiracy is a well-recognized phenomenon in law, and there is a substantial body of law to deal with criminal conspiracy. When I started investigating this, I was remarkably humbled. Let me tell you a little story. When I was a, either a, a, just before turning a teenager or as I turned a teenager, my mother and I, my family, were vacationing on a lake that, where my father had recently bought property. And we 
in the exploring of the lake, we found this stream that was hung over with bushes. And there was no buildings around it. And we thought we had made a marvelous discovery. So we traveled up this stream. There were no houses on either side of it. And imagine our disappointment when we discovered that we had not discovered an undiscovered stream. We had discovered one of the sources of the Upper Eau Claire Lake. And there were marvelous, beautiful houses up on the lake that was upstream. Working on modern myths is very much like that. I have been both humbled and delighted to find out how much other people have already studied these phenomena. And I wanted to call your attention to uh, two or three of them. And those of you to whom I have uh, requested your email addresses, I'll add your email addresses to my list and send out. I have a list of websites that are very useful for getting actual information. One of them is CorbettReports.com and you're aware of many of the others, but one that I want to call attention to for the moment is JoePlumber.com. And the reason I applaud uh, Mr. Plumber's, and this is not Joe the Plumber, it's Joe Plumber, and it's P-L-U-M-M-E-R, not P-L-U-M-B-E-R. Those of you who are old enough to remember certain presidential campaigns will know what I'm talking about that in that reference. But Jim Corbett and Joe Plummer have done a very good job of exploring a number of aspects of modern society and the ways that we sheep have been deceived. So I want you to know about JoePlummer.com and CorbettReports.com and I will add that to my list as well as uh, a recent news site is called The Duran, T-H-E-D-U-R-A-N dot com. But that, those of you who have gotten my emails before already have this list and I update it periodically and that's one of the updates. One of the key, one of the most embarrassing publications for the ruling elite is a book called Tragedy and Hope by Carol Quigley. Carol Quigley was a, an excellent scholar. He was actually um, Bill Clinton's mentor and teacher at Hopkins. And Carol Quigley was an, he was not a member of the ruling elite, but he was sufficiently East Coast academic and sympathetic with the goals that he was invited to examine their books for a couple of years and he was an insider's insider though he wasn't a member of the ruling elite. And he was invited to write this history and he called it Tragedy and Hope, a history of our time, a history in our time if I recall correctly. And it's a marvelous tome, 1300 and some pages relatively small print, written the way an East Coast academic would write it. In other words, you have to take a lot of coffee to get through it. Joe Plummer has done a great service for us. Actually, several writers on the internet have done services because 95% of Tragedy and Hope is accurate and dull history. Facts, lists, and lists, and kind of like the Old Testament listing genealogy. Okay? But 5% of it are crystal clear summations of intentions, goals, and actions. Now, Joe Plummer has done an excellent job by condensing tragedy and hope down to a little book of 100 pages called Tragedy, Tragedy and Hope 101, which is downloadable as a PDF from Joe Plummer's website. Several other people have chosen excerpts from Tragedy and Hope that tell us a great deal 
more about the ruling elites than they ever intended. In fact, as a, um, as a way of describing how unhappy Carol Quigley's associates were, Quigley got it published and it sold like hotcakes. And people kept asking him when the second edition is going to go out and be printed. And his publisher kept putting him off and kept putting him off. But the publisher didn't release the copyright privileges. The publisher maintained the copyright pri privileges so that Quigley could not go to another publisher and republish it <coughs> under a different company. It was clear that the information that Quigley had revealed was, was embarrassing to the people who had initially opened up their, uh, opened up their books and their thought processes to Dr. Quigley. So, I'm going to describe, without trying to prove anything, some of the ruling elites. And then as we go through some of the people I'm going to introduce you to, some of the events and sequences of events, I think you will see why I identify these groups as members of the ruling elite. In 1694, the Bank of England was, the, was established. That sounds like a governmental agency, doesn't it? But it's not. It's a private bank that agreed to function as the bank for the English government. And it became the model, and I strongly suspect, and if I recall correctly, it was um, William of Orange that made this agreement, and there are reasons why he made the agreement. I suspect he didn't realize the power he was putting in the hands of certain bankers because they had the power to create money to loan to the Bank of England. They were in control of the money supply. Instead of the sovereign power, the king in this case, being the creator of money, the Bank of England became the creator of money. For I think approximately 600 years prior to this time, maybe it was 400 years, money had been created by the king with tally sticks. And the beauty of the tally sticks were that they were, of, they were inscribed with certain marks so that you know that this tally stick was worth X number of British pounds and this tally stick was worth this much of British pounds. And the tally sticks were used as money because that was the form of money that King required his taxes to be paid in. And as long as the taxes were being paid in, it became common currency for buying bread and for buying beef or whatever. When the King surrendered this sovereign power of creating money by making the tally sticks, I'm not sure he understood exactly what power he was delivering. So bankers at this point became the major element of the ruling elites. Were there Venetian bankers? You betcha. Were there Belgian bankers? You betcha. They, they talked to one another. They worked with one another. It was a consortium, whether it was written down on paper or not. Now, General Wesley Clark and Dr. Stephen Jones got into a whole lot of trouble for saying that it was bankers behind this project or that project. Because Wesley Clark was accused of using code for New York bankers, i.e. Jews. And Stephen Jones lost his job at Brigham Young University. Actually, he was forced into retirement. He was forced into taking early retirement because certain people accused him of using code of bankers for New York Jews. Well, I'm not using code, ladies and gentlemen. I'm saying these are bankers. And although a lot of bankers in the Middle Ages were Jews, not all of them were. 
And as I've mentioned in classes before, if anyone thinks Lord Rothschild has more in, in common with Tevye the milkman than he has with David Rockefeller, he's not living in the same world as I am. So, the ruling elites were largely bankers at the end of the 17th century. By the beginning of the 18th century, you had more bankers. The, one of the Rothschilds, and I, 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 Amsel, Amsel Rothschild, made a lot of money at the, uh, over the um, Battle of Napoleon at Waterloo. He had informants who were able to get information to him, and he was able to use that information to trick the stock exchange in London. So you had bankers up until, uh, bankers comprising the vast majority of the ruling elite, because money is their, money initially is their source of power. In the 19th century, and in, in England in the 18th century, you had other people developing enormous wealth. You had the beginning of the industrial age. I call it the age of the robber barons in the United States, but you had industrialists making all kinds of money on what amounted to slave labor in England uh, by the process of mechanization and industrialization. You had English industrialists intentionally impoverishing English farmers because the English industrialists needed the farmers to be working in their shops, in their factories, so they abolished the corn laws, allowing Indian wheat to be sold competitively with British wheat in the London and in the countryside of, of Great Britain. That drove English farmers out of business. It drove them into towns just the way uh, southern blacks and southern whites were driven into the northern industrial cities in the United States in the early 20th century, where, there, where, where farming ceases to become uh, a way of making a living you go to the cities to get a job from an industry. It happened in the 18th century in England, it happened in the 20th century in the United States. The point that I'm making, however, here is that you had a broadening of the group that I'm calling the ruling elites. You had a movement both in England and in the United States to shape society. An interview that we may listen to, not, certainly not today, but eventually, Norman Dodd was raised with a silver spoon in his mouth. Nice guy. Uh, and he went to a um, prep school and he went to I think Harvard, but I'm not 100% certain on that. And when he got a job at a bank, he did not get a job as a teller or a clerk. He got a job as, a, uh, as an assistant vice president. He was already in that social class that was expected to take leadership. Unfortunately, Norman Dodd was a, a, both an insightful and a relatively honest human being. And when asked, when the Great Depression took place, uh, he asked the question, why did it occur? And his bosses basically favoring him, basically humoring him, they said, Norm, we are appointing you an investigator of one to go find out why the depression, why the bank failures took place and what we can do to stop them, stop it from happening again. He came back about three years later and it, it's really interesting, you can download these interviews on YouTube, Norman Dodd, D-O-D-D, -D, and he gives uh, interviews with Stanley Monteith, 
and also with G. Edward Griffin. He came back a couple years later and said, um, Mr. Gloss, this is why it took place, A, B, C, and D, and the way to prevent it is basically to un re revert to sound banking principles. Now, he, those words had to be put into his mouth by his boss, but the list of requirements that Dodd came up with was precisely a return to sound banking accounting principles. And Mr. Dodd said, yes, that's basically what I'm saying we should do. And he said, his boss said, Norm, social pressures have been established in the United States today that you will never see sound banking principles exercised in the United States again. Now, I, had, I did a look, little looking around to make sure that Norman Dodd's boss had the intellectual and banking authority to make that statement. And his boss at the time, the firm that Norm Dodd was working for at the time, was J.P. Morgan. It wasn't J.P. Morgan Chase at the time, but it was J.P. Morgan. So that's a, a fairly reliable source of banking information. Dodd tells us that back when tax-exempt foundations were initially established, I've got to go back and, and, and interrupt. One of, when Dodd lost his job at J.P. Morgan, he found out he was unemployable. When he found out he was unemployable, he, he was very knowledgeable about the banking industry and about finances in general, and he became, in the 50s, he was assigned the research director for the Reese Committee. The Reese Committee was set up to investigate the activities of the tax-exempt foundations to find out. At that point, we were investigating all kinds of agencies that might or might not, not be communist covers for better and for worse. But the Reese Committee was set the assignment of finding out what the tax-exempt foundations were actually doing. In the process of investigating the tax-exempt foundations, Dodd was given access to the minutes of several tax-exempt foundations, like the Ford Foundation and Carnegie Foundation. What he found out is that these tax-exempt foundations from their very beginning had set out to shape, in this case, American society, and had set out to shape it in such a fashion that, now I'll, I will use my words now instead of Dodd's, they were set up to set up to create a nation of sheep obediently following their leaders. I want to flip over and think of and talk about Inglis for a moment, but I won't just yet. But one of their first questions of these tax exempt foundations was what is the most powerful way of shaping, of changing the direction of an entire nation? Is there any way more powerful than war to get a nation to change direction? And they had months of scholarly discussion. And they concluded there was no more efficient way of shaping the direction in which a nation is developing than by getting them into a war. So they contacted the administration that at this time happened to be Woodrow Wilson, and they said, when we get into World War I, don't let it end, end too soon. Because what I'm telling you is almost certainly news to the vast majority of you, I encourage you to download the two different interviews by Dodd. One with Stan Monteith, the other with G. Edward Griffin. Because they are well worth listening to, because Dodd gained access to the thinking of the ruling elites. One of the key elements that I want to shape what I want to share with you now, though, however, is that we are not only talking about financiers. 
We are talking about industrialists. Industrialists who want to have a nation that is predictable. Walter Littman, in the early 20th century, said the public cannot be relied upon to determine public policy. We want to create a public that are interested observers of what is going on in the world, not having the illusion of thinking they're doing something about it. <coughs> With the passing of the 16th Amendment to the Constitution, allowing for the collection of taxes on earned income, that will be another interesting subject. And with the passing of the Federal Reserve Act, bankers in the United States acquired a source of funding, that is, the public pocketbook, and they acquired a source of power, that is, the power of controlling the money supply. With that in hand, and in cooperation with industrialists, they went about shaping the United States, they went about shaping Europe. They funded the development of Adolf Hitler and the rise of National Socialism. They funded a significant portion of the industrialization of the Soviet Union once it had been formed. And they are currently now working to establish a world government that is exempt from the rules of sovereign government. The European Union is an ex a great example of the direction in which these ruling elites want to take. And I, I encourage you to download Tragedy and Hope 101. I encourage you to at least listen to some of the summaries of Carol Quigley, because if you understand Carol Quigley, you've got 70% of what I want to share with you this semester. But be that as it may. At the end of World War II, the United States was the ruling power. Germany had lost millions of soldiers as well as millions of civilians. The Soviet Union had lost 22 to 28 million people. If I recall correctly, China had lost 35 million and Europe as a whole had had its industrial base destroyed. The only power with financial and military capability in the world, for all practical purposes, was the United States. The Soviet Union was a behind-the-scenes competitor, but they had nothing like either the military or the industrial capacity that the United States had. So the United States has been shaping the world the way it wants for the last X number of years. Where I'm going with this is the way they have shaped it has been striking and it's one of the reasons that I wanted to call attention to what Hillary Clinton had to say about the United States being a, a, uh, a shining city on the hill. William Bloom has written a book He's written several books, and I, I applaud uh, Mr. Bloom a great deal. But his most important book, in my opinion, is Killing Hope, in which Mr. Bloom outlines the multitude of countries that the United States has, has destroyed and or usurped their power and or turned them into vassal states. They did it in Chile by abolishing the uh, lawfully democratically elected uh, Salvador Allende and replacing him with Augusto Pinochet. He did it in, or the CIA as the arm of the United States, did it by uh, undermining the reign of Musa, uh, Mohammed Mossadegh in Iran. If you have any questions as to why Iran is hostile towards the United States, take a look at the history of the United States and Iran in the 1950s. But I'm going to take us up to the present to this extent. Between the 50s 
and the 80s in the Americas the United States was basically undermining governments with the CIA. In Europe, they were managing things with what's called Operation Gladio. We will get into Operation Gladio more, but as a summary, Operation Gladio was a, a group of secret armies that were established in virtually every country of Europe initially set up in order to act as a secret army in the event of a Soviet invasion of Western Europe. And there may or may not have been some justification for it then, although the Soviet Union showed no evidence whatsoever of going beyond Germany. And they had every intention of going to Germany because the, the Germans had created enormous hostility and anger in the Soviet people. But Operation Gladio was initially set up as a counterweight to the possibility of communist invasion of Western Europe. But when it became obvious that the Soviets were not going to invade France or Italy, the Gla Operation Gladio people, people, personnel, were used to undercut democracy in various countries. And as I say, we will look at some videos, probably not today because I want to show you some of the things that David K. Johnston has said. But Gladio was used in order to terrify people in various countries so that they would demand greater authoritarian governments. You have several bombings in Italy, and you had random shootings in Belgium, and as I say, these elements of these forces were literally all over. That they used Gladio as a way of shaping Western Europe between the 50s and the 80s. Non-governmental organizations started taking over a great deal of what the CIA had been doing for those 20 or 30 years. So now you have organizations like George Soros, I think it's called Freedom Society. You have non-governmental organizations undermining governments of the former Soviet Union and working to undermine governments in South America. With that as background, I want to sh show you a few things from David K. Johnston. I'm looking for that I'm going to play something for you because I am having a little trouble and I think that I'll do you the favor of playing this.
and the money all spent. We imagine from every direction. The workers get charged while the wealthy relax. With nary a moment's reflection. When it's gross, there's muck. And it don't give an ass. Cause I grow back with this insurrection. And I say, what are the bankers and politicians? What are He's an excellent reporter uh, who has been investigating uh, the way the wealthy shaft the 99%. I'm saying it in perhaps slightly crude fashion, but he, he is a, a reporter who's exposing the variety of ways that the law is purchased by the wealthy in order to shape the law according to to that which will benefit the very, very rich. Uh, one of his books is called Strictly Legal. The titles of the other two do not immediately come to mind. Uh, but I would encourage you to read. He takes, he doesn't draw strong enough conclusions in my opinion. He thinks the federal income tax is a legitimate tax and was passed legitimately. And somewhere along the line we'll a, take a look at the variety of irregularities in that were involved in the uh, uh, the passing and the uh, ratifying of the 16th Amendment. But what he has to say here, let's see, I want to get it at us. David K. Johnson, K. Where is that decision for you? I, I was covering this stuff, and what I wanted to do was make sure that people understood what, were, what was going on in these demonstrations. I would pick up some of the competing papers, and back then there were a whole slew of competing papers in the Bay Area, all the different elements. He's covering L.A. And I think the time of civil the unrest. was like, that's not what happened. Uh, and, and so I made it a point to be right in them. Uh, I got hit a number of times, sometimes by radicals, sometimes by cops with nightsticks. Uh, but I would get right into them so that I could talk about what was going on in these things. And I got people who invited me to their homes. There were right-wing loonies who built bombs who I met, and there were left-wing loonies who built bombs. And um, what was your own attitude towards Vietnam War? Um, 
I wasn't, I mean, I thought it was kind of a dumb idea, but I wasn't, you know, oh, this is awful. Now, because I had children, I wasn't going to be drafted. Maybe that had some effect on it. Um, but um, it was like, this is a stupid, dumb adventure. It was sort of the, the you know, I had no outrage beyond that level about it. I uh, just did, thought it was, didn't make a lot of sense. If you'd been drafted, would you have gone? Oh, well, sure. No, no, I would have complied with the law. Yeah. Um, and, That's one place and, where I disagree with them. But I was learning about all these different things, and you would meet people who, unbeknownst to each other, might live, you know, six blocks apart, and one of them has this view that, you know, the communists are at the door, and they're going to take over the world, and then you meet somebody else who, uh, they're not a card-carrying communist, but they're a communist, and they want to take down the system. And I go, you know, you live in almost identical houses in suburbia a few blocks apart. How do you come to these totally different perspectives? And uh, in all of this, you had um, uh, these police red squads who were around. Anybody paying attention knew about them. What I didn't know at the time and appreciate was the degree to which there were agents provocateur that is, undercover police officers whose job is to try and get people who wanted to be peaceful in their dissent to do something violent. So the I won't, uh, would like you to remember that French phrase, agents provocateur, very important, and we'll, get, we'll deal with it at length in a moment. Police would have excuses to arrest people and knock heads. And, and at, at the time, a lot of the protesters and leaders of protests were accusing the police of that. They were denying all of that. Yes. And later, that actually turned out that is what you, and part of it, your investigation, so yes. you actually found that to be true. Well, um, I left and went to, uh, briefly, the University of Chicago and then to the Detroit Free Press for three years and did all investigative reporting. And then I was hired by the Los Angeles Times in 1976 to come back to San Francisco. And a couple of years later, moved to L.A. And in Los Angeles, um, they, I had wrote a couple of stories for the L.A. Times about undercover operations and how uh, I got a whole document showing that the California National Guard, under uh, Lieutenant Colonel Giafrida, was teaching martial rule, not martial law. And they were also not teaching that military leaders who take over have a duty to hand authority back to civilians. They only gave the takeover lesson, not the restoration of civilian power lesson. So anyhow, then I went to Los Angeles in 1979, and an editor there began sending me over to cover the police commission. There was an assigned reporter who was a terrific reporter, but she wrote features. And so he would send her out of town to write features, and pretty soon it became my story. And so I began writing about the LAPD's Public Disorder Intelligence Division. That was their Red Squad. And I understood that they were doing stuff they ought not to be doing, and it was apparently a pretty big unit and somewhat out of control. But I figured, yes, yeah, this is police fall to roll, and nobody has a control over them until an event. I go to a social event for a retiring LA police officer, and police chief Daryl Gates signals everybody to go away. And unlike today, where all sorts of politicians won't talk to reporters, they run away from them, Gates is a sophisticated guy. He always wanted to talk to me. He always wanted to know what I was up to. Didn't matter if he wanted to throttle me, he wanted to talk to me. He signals everybody to go away, and he says in the sometimes crude language of cops, something to the effect of perhaps I have an affinity for large bosomed red-headed women. Meaning you have. Yeah, and I thought, well, where is this coming from? And while I'm trying to figure out what to say next, I go, uh, I'm sure, Daryl, who doesn't? And he then begins to unload on a blind date that I had known with a woman I've now been married to for more than 32 years. Um, what we ate, uh, critiqued the champagne that I ordered on its likely success at getting some further uh, intimacy. And I, I just, I'm like thinking, this is astonishing. Why is he doing this? And it suddenly occurs to me, oh, he's trying to intimidate me. So I egg him on, and when he's given me everything he has, I just, I looked at him, and I said, you know, Daryl, several things I know you don't know about me. And this is not the reaction he expects, so he's a little surprised. I said, first of all, um, maybe I have screw this, but I don't intimidate. You know, I run into a burning building and almost run into another one, and, uh, I'm just, I've lived through six riots, and I just don't have a fear button. And nobody cares who I'm involved with. Um, oh, listen, i got to talk to Sergeant so-and-so. And I walked off. So we had each given each other a message here. But I went home that night and went, oh my God, it's true. 
everything I've been hearing, that they're spying on city council members and politicians, and that he has a list of who's had affairs with who, it's probably all true. And I know, one last thing, Paul, I knew the LA Times didn't want to publish this. I want, I want to stop, because I really want to dig into this story. So I just want to back up one step. Sure. So tell me the story of May Day 81. Okay, is it 81? Yeah. This issue of the role of police provocateurs, right. it's very important because right. because the, whenever a fight would break out and the cops got into a fight, it was always this example, crazy anarchists just trying to cause chaos and, and disorder, and that's the TV images. That's right. Well, there's a famous uh, TV episode that you've seen show up in movies and elsewhere where a group of black protesters are complaining about the LAPD and somebody jumps up and says, let's go kill cops. And suddenly a bunch of people are shouting and happy. Well, that meeting actually took place. But every single person who got up and shouted, let's go kill cops, and who in the actual meeting was told, sit down and shut up. By, by the real by leadership. By the real leadership, were undercover cops. We now know this because of years later. So May Day 1981, the Revolutionary Communist Party, and talk about a really crazy group of people, both Beijing and, and uh, Moscow, had said, we have nothing to do with these people. They're crazy. They decide they're going to have a march through downtown LA on May Day. They have a demonstration, they draw, I don't know, maybe three, four hundred people. It's the biggest thing they ever put together. And they start peacefully marching towards downtown. And all of a sudden, they start running. The police appear at the next street corner in riot gear. They beat everybody up. The revolutionaries regroup, they march through downtown, there's no more violence. I wrote a story uh, almost a year later with videotape proving that the running was done at the direction of an undercover LA police officer in a baseball cap on, where everybody's walking along peacefully and he goes, run, run! And then you see him in the camera back up like this out of the picture. The LA Police Department did this sort of thing repeatedly in various forms. And I named in the LA Times, and I was flabbergasted that they were willing to do it, but I named and outed several of these undercover spies. I always told the police department, we're going to name this guy tomorrow because if you think he's in danger, you got plenty of time to go get it. I proved that one officer had been ordered by the chief to sleep with a woman to get political information out of her. What do spies do? This is Gates. Chief Gates. Buff guy, fresh out of the academy, going to an organization. Oh, here's a woman who's not attached. She'll start telling you everything between the sheets. I actually had seven other women who told me the same story, but by the time I got to them, they were married, they had children, or they left radical politics, and they wouldn't go in the right The same story that they, a cop seduced them, sleeps with them, and uses them to get information about a radical group. Right. And in one case, for three years, where you got to wonder a little bit about the woman's judgment after three years. And Gates would always say that all of this political stuff that was coming out through lawsuits brought by the ACLU is just garbage they didn't care about. In fact, he spent 45 minutes to two hours a day reading over this stuff. He was incredibly aware of these things. And uh, there came a point where um, uh, Ira Reiner, the city attorney and later district attorney of LA, had his office burglarized. Uh, my cars were burglarized seven different times, including once underneath Parker Center, the police headquarters. And the reason I'm positive the police did it was, I don't smoke. So I always had coins in the, in, the, uh, uh, in the ashtray. And what would be gone through the cars, every scrap of paper, except my driver's license, uh, registration, and you know, the material you have to have for the police, uh, auto, auto insurance, and the coins. And yeah, I think what thief, what thief takes paper? David K. Johnson there is talking about the LAPD, the uh, police department, yeah. however, when you see films of Venezuelans rioting in opposition to their government, when you see Brazilians rioting against their government, take a look to see whether the government is opposing American policy or is it endorsing American policy. Most recently, uh, President Rousseff lost her job because it was done legally but incredibly immorally because everyone who voted for her impeachment was under investigation. The tragic reality is that many of the politicians in South and Central America are in the pockets of the American ruling elite. Don't know if it's, do you, 
Do you consider the media? Do you consider the uh, the money people? Do you? They they all form a conglomerate so that they get the message. Now, the reason I wanted you to pay a special attention to the uh, role of agent provocateur is that you'll recall that the Ukraine underwent a, an orange revolution, Georgia underwent a rose revolution, Kyrgyzstan underwent a tulip revolution in the early 20th, 21st century. Every one of those revolutions was led by people who had been trained to foment unrest in the former Soviet colonies. And they had precisely collected, they had observed who was a natural leader and they picked him up and they groomed him or her. That's not the only form of agent provocateur. I'm going to play you an audio tape in a few moments where William Engdahl tells us how the uh, radical jihadists have been used by the CIA. But I want you to know that the former Soviet, the former portions of the Soviet Union have been under economic and social attack for the last 15 years. Russia is, was not under attack in the 1990s because Boris Yeltsin opened his doors and said, come on in folks, just give me my cut. Vladimir Putin is not doing that. So the point of provocateurs is whenever you see something, question whether the story you are being told is the real story. You may or may not want to use some of the sources that I use, because if you are watching NBC or CBS or public television, you're getting propaganda. I wish I, I wish I, I wish that were not so. It was progressively obvious after 9/11. <coughs> one of the other things that Joe Plummer has, by the way, he's got a one-hour seminar on 9-11. For any of the, those who, of you who may still be inclined to believe the uh, government's account of what happened on 9-11, go to Joe Plummer's website and just read through his material. Somewhere probably next week, because we're not going to have time today, we're going to take a look at how we started becoming so stupid. And I say we, because it is not an accident that Americans have lost their sense of curiosity. It is not an accident that a five-year-old will look at something and say, how does that happen? And a 55-year-old will say, what did Walter Cronkite say about it? So, the audio tape that I'm about to play for you now is by William Engdahl, who's written, he's a marvelous author, marvelous, like Const Johnston, but Johnston doesn't take his research as far as I think it needs to go because I think he thinks the system works. It is people who are corrupt, and I think he's wrong there. But let me call attention to Bill Engdahl. I won't play the whole thing, but, and the, the, the video is for nothing. But. Good to be with you, Eric. Uh, the Probably right in the book, The Lost Hegemon, uh, sort of destroyed. First, if you go on my website or go on uh, your blog, as, as you just told me, you'll see a striking cover where the title of The Lost Hegemon is barely legible. It's faded gray on a white background. Deliberately so, because the hegemon, of course, is the United States as a warrior empire since World War II or since the creation of the Cold War. And the next to the title is a very, very battered and tattered American flag that uh, reportedly was recovered from the rubble in the World Trade Towers, Twin Towers after 9-11. And the idea is the 
But the neocons correctly call it empire because it's not an American democracy that we have any say in. It's become an oligarchy, just like we talk about Ukrainian oligarchs or Russian oligarchs or whatever. It's become an oligarchy of billionaires or gigabillionaires nowadays. People like George Soros, David Rockefeller, Ted Turner, uh, Warren Buffett, uh, whatever. And people whose names most Americans have never heard of, Russell family, other names. And these oligarchs, I call them patriarchs, they sit there on their thrones like they were the gods of the universe. They hate it, by the way, they hate the gods. But that's, uh, that's their <coughs> hypnosis, I suppose. But our hypnosis that we respect them with that kind of power. And the lost hegemon describes the process by which the CIA at the end of the 1940s, at the beginning of the 1950s, began discovering the potentials of an organization called the Muslim Brotherhood, Hillary Clinton's favorite Muslim group, by the way. The Muslim Brotherhood is a terrorist organization that was created by Hassan al Banna in Egypt in the 1920s. And in the 1950s, the CIA did something rather diabolical. They had to get the leadership of the Brotherhood out of Egypt after they failed an assassination attempt on uh, President Nasser. So Miles Copeland, the station chief in Cairo at the time, uh, got the Brotherhood, Brotherhood leadership into Saudi Arabia, which was a client state of the U.S. then up until virtually the present. They haven't had any formal break as far as I know. The fusion of Wahhabism, desert camel humping uh, Islam from the 1700s, the most primitive uh, fundamentalist is Islam uh, that there is anywhere on the planet. Yeah. The Saudi oil money and the political activism of the assassination cults, it's a secret death cult, it's the Muslim Brotherhood, uh, of the Brotherhood, created the beginnings of a worldwide Muslim federation. Their first target was Pakistan, and then Afghanistan, if these names sound familiar, it's not an accident. And then what happens, they, after uh, a decade or so of, of uh, kind of uh, experimenting in different ways with, with this organization, this Saudi oil money and the uh, Muslim Brotherhood uh, uh, evangelism, I guess you could call it. It's not a religion, it's a death cult. Uh, they made the decision to, and this was the big new Brzezinski had a big part to play in this in 1979 as President Carter's national security advisor. He wrote a classified memo to Carter saying, let's use radical Islam to create Russia's or the Soviet Vietnam in Afghanistan. Let's provoke them to invade Afghanistan and if they take the bait and bring the Red Army in to protect their uh, asset, the uh, then leadership of Afghanistan, the president, then we will activate these uh, Islamists called Mujahideen. And it documents the book, the Los Angeles documents how the head of Saudi intelligence, who was head of Saudi intelligence right up until September 11th, 2001, come along how he explicitly sent a young Saudi, a Wahhabist, to Pakistan to work with the Pakistani CIA and hand recruit, hand pick and select and recruit radical, fanatical Islamic terrorists from all over the world, mainly from Saudi Arabia, to become part of what was called Mujahideen, the Mujahideen in, in Afghanistan to create guerrilla warfare, sabotage, and everything else against the Soviet Red Army soldiers. And the operation, the most expensive CIA operation in, in history up until that time, took 10 years before the Soviet Union said, we leave Afghanistan. So what happens is that, in the book documents all of this in great detail, excuse me, the CIA, through one of their rogue airlines, General Secord of Iran Contra fame, uh, ran as part of the operation. They flew the leading jihadists of the Muslim Brotherhood, Mujahideen, from 
Afghanistan into Azerbaijan because British Petroleum, Atlantic Ridge Fuel, which was a Rockefeller oil group company at that time, the Anglo American oil tracks wanted to grab the oil of Baku from the newly independent Azerbaijan uh, government, independent from the Soviet Union, as the Soviet woke up. And they wanted to control that oil. There was one problem. The oil of Baku had a pipeline that had been built during the Soviet era, because Azerbaijan was a part of the Soviet Union, that was running through Russia toward Moscow, and from there it would link into the uh, Russian pipeline grid and go on to world oil markets. Well, British and American oil companies, Dick Cheney's Halliburton, played a role in that game, wanted none of that, so they brought the Mujahideen into Chechnya, which is exactly Grozny, exactly along the route of that Russian oil pipeline. And lo and behold, those jihadi crazy terrorists blew that Russian oil pipeline to smithereens and created such havoc there that uh, British Petroleum and the American oil companies were able to build a Anglo-American pipeline from Baku through Georgia into Turkey, a NATO member country, and from Turkey on to Western oil markets, mainly Europe. So then the CIA, about three decades ago, began perhaps its most incredible Islamist operation or, or a jihadist operation, jihadi terror operation. They took a, an illiterate uh, Turkish imam from the backwoods of, of Anatolia named Fethullah Gulen and made him the front man for one of the most integral, one of the most dangerous CIA opera terrorist operations in the world today called the Fethullah Gulen Semak Organization. Now the July 15 coup d'etat, the fatal coup d'etat that almost assassinated Erdogan, the president of Turkey, who had, up until 2013, he had an electoral alliance with the Gulenists inside Turkey because uh, they pushed him over the top with, with the elections with his AKP party, his AKP party. But in 2013, they had an open split over many issues, really. And from that time on, Erdogan began to see Gulen as, as an enemy, not as a friend. And the coup d'etat that was done, attempted on July 15th was run by the CIA, the handlers, the sponsors of Lulin's permanent green card in Pennsylvania in 2004, Graeme Fuller and another CIA handler of, of Lulin's named uh, Henry Parkey. They were in Istanbul, just outside Istanbul, on the evening of who they even both admitted it, which uh, is a little bit foolish for CIA agents to be doing. Uh, so this network has been responsible. They, they are the godfather of Al-Qaeda, first in Iraq, then in Syria, well, of course, Al-Qaeda in Afghanistan. They are the godfather of what morphed in a few years ago, the training by the CIA and uh, uh, Saudi money, Qatari money. They morphed into something called the Islamic State in Iraq and Syria, the ISIS, which then changed its name to the fraudulent Islamic State. This is nothing but a Western intelligence front operation, U.S., British, Israeli intelligence, to create uh, fronts for essentially grabbing directly with U.S. military control the oil riches of oil and gas now. This is a pipeline war over natural gas since the European Union made gas a priority for its, its greenhouse effect. Uh, this is a war over energy. It has nothing to do with faith or honor or anything. I'm sorry to disappoint any uh, The sound is not great, but Bill's point is that the wars that we are engaged in, that our government is engaged in, have zero to do with religion, and they certainly have zero to do with democracy. They have everything to do with hegemony, has everything to do with energy supplies. Let me clarify or let me summarize what Mr. Engel was saying about the uh, jihadis. 
political Islam represented by the Muslim Brotherhood was driven out of Egypt and was invited into Saudi Arabia where fundamentalist Islam was already as well established. It had been the form of Islam practiced by this, the Saudi regime for two, two centuries. It was decided by the people who successfully got the Saudis to accept the Muslim Brotherhood to use Islamic political fundamentalism as a political and military weapon. Brzezinski said, let's use the jihadis to defeat the Soviets because there was a, there was a government in Afghanistan that was socialist. And I should say that anything other than straightforward exploitative capitalism is anathema to the ruling elites. You cannot believe that Cuba has been under sanction for the last 70 years because they have misbehaved. They are what is most feared by the ruling elites. They are a good example. It's exactly the reason Yugoslavia needed to be destroyed. It was an example of socialism that worked for the people. So, Billet uh, is saying that the jihadis were used to attack the socialist government in Afghanistan. The Soviets came in to support the Soviet, the socialist government in Afghanistan, and the Mujahideen were armed and trained by the United States in order to provide an excellent uh, way of destroying the Soviet military and, this, and to deeply uh, damage the Soviet economy. After they succeeded in damaging the Soviet economy and the Soviets withdrew from Afghanistan, they were then shipped to Chechnya to foment a Chechen war against Russia. They were then sent to Azerbaijan to destroy the Soviet pipeline so that the uh, Seven Sisters could have access to Azerbaijani oil. The jihadis who are currently attacking the government of Bashar al-Assad in, in Syria are funded, guess who? Saudi Arabia and Qatar, and through the back door, since Saudi Arabia and Qatari are very close allies of the United States, by the United States government. So, radical Islam, jihadi Islam, can be used as a way of fomenting war, bought and paid for politicians can be a, a way of modifying governments. Every politician in Europe is basically, almost every politician in Europe is currently in the pay of the US government. And then you can develop color revolutions where you create dissension within societies precisely in order to weaken the central government so that they will be subject to either Washington pressure or Washington takeover. Go to William Bloom uh, for Killing Hope, and I'll send you some of these websites. We've got a lot of history. One of the weakness, in fact, perhaps the principal weakness, no, I can't say that, there are too many. One of the major weaknesses of American education is we really have no understanding of history. My grandchild is sold, is being sold on the idea that the Civil War was fought over slavery. I've read some of the newspapers from 1859 and 1860, what the editorials were talking about. I've read Abraham Lincoln's first inaugural speech. Guess what? 
Abraham Lincoln in his first inauguration, inaugural speech endorsed slavery and promised no hostile action towards slaveholding states. None. But he did say that he was going to enforce the taxation system. And the taxation system the southerners felt was punitive towards their cotton industry. A little history goes a long way to making modern history like Syria make sense. I'm going to stop for now because to start another subject would get get us in too deeply. Thank you. Well, Are there thank questions? Thank you very much. Yes. I apologize for I'm going to have to put numbers on these because my eyes just don't scan over my. But I think you enjoyed the song. Uh, yeah, yes, very, very much. much. <laughs> <laughs> Musical interview.